Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Hello, hello. Today, I have the pleasure and privilege of bringing to you Matthew Sweeney. Matthew is a gifted, longtime yoga teacher practitioner. He has roots in the Ashtanga lineage, and he teaches vinyasa flow and self-practice in the vinyasa method. He lives on the island of Bali in Indonesia, and he's originally from Australia, as you'll hear. During this discussion, we talk about the roots in Ashtanga and sequential patterning of the first, second, third, and fourth series, and also the concept of vinyasa flow and how to build a balance between these two approaches. And I also talked to Matthew about how he works with students and how he manages injury and communication with students to figure out how to move forward to heal. And so this is a really great conversation. I just, I'm so thankful. Thank you, Matthew, for taking the time and speaking with us or with me and sharing with all of us. Uh, We need this. We need uh, senior teachers to share their thoughts and ideas and help us to grow as yoga practitioners, body workers, meditation practitioners, breath workers, um, pranayama, all of the above. And so without uh, wasting or, sorry, waiting any further here, let's go ahead and bring Matthew on the podcast. Here we go. Hello, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak with Matthew Sweeney. And Matthew, how are you doing this evening or this this morning for you over there? Yeah, this morning. No, I'm doing very well, thanks. Excellent. Really good to hear. I am excited to have a second opportunity here to converse with you. It was about a year and a half ago that we were able to do a podcast in 2020. And I'm excited to have a a second chance to speak with you. I feel like last time we had a good long conversation, even at the end, I feel like we could have kept on going. So here I get an opportunity to ask you a couple more questions. So thank you for being patient with me and, and for sharing your information and knowledge with, with us. Uh, I'm curious, how have things progressed for you in the last year and a half? Uh, Well, um, well, in most ways, I mean, Bali's finally opening up this year, so um, starting to see a lot more tourists and so on now, and so that feels good to have people around. I haven't started live courses here yet. That'll happen. Well, I'm having one start in a couple of months in September, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. But um, yeah, basically, the last eighteen months, I've <laughs> sounds bizarre when I think this in my head, so I'll say it out loud. Is um, I've, I've, I've built an online business uh, teaching online yoga classes. <laughs> it's a very strange, strange thing. <laughs> no. um, I could talk a lot about it, but I won't. I don't think that's the purpose today. But but I, I think for people listening to this, I think it's important. Um, I, I've, as a teacher, I've found I've, well, I, I like to think so. I don't know. I could be wrong. But I think I've really improved um, because of the medium has forced me to explore different nuances and details of how I've generally taught in the past. And so, firstly, online classes have allowed other people to access me more easily. And um, I've just really, yeah, spent a lot of time thinking about how I want to teach. And I think some of it is to do with, because I'm limited, it's audio and visual, there's no physical contact. Yeah. Because there's a limitation there in that, it means I've had to improve on, well, I don't know how much I've really improved my, my, my cueing and my, <laughs> my verbal stuff. Probably that's gotten worse. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in terms of like details and how I've 
you know, I don't know. There's a, a whole lot of details that I think that has helped me to improve. So I just encourage students and teachers who may not have access to, to teachers like me, you know, make use of it. I think it's a wonderful medium. And then if you can do in-person stuff, it's fantastic as well. I mean, this podcast is a good example of that in another way, you know. I agree, Matthew. It has been an incredible learning curve. I have to admit I'm surprised that it's still relatively closed there in terms of people being able to travel to Bali in Indonesia. Is is it that people still it just it's been closed and people aren't able to travel in freely? Well, since at the start of the year, it was closed, but since the start, it's, it's opened up to select countries and that's becoming more and more. So I'm not actually quite aware of the full restrictions at the moment. I mean, you do have to be vaccinated to come here. I mean, a lot of countries have that rule. So, yeah. um, so but it is opening up. And so that's happened quite quickly just this year. So, um, gotcha. yeah, that's, that's for people running businesses like mine. It's, you know, God, it's, it's all been waiting, you know, oh, not man. to mention... The local community suffering with just lack of funds and resources. It's, it's, you know, anyway. I can imagine. Are you looking forward to having in-person instruction again? Is that something that you feel like you can? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm not totally looking forward to it. And like it's been, what's it? Two more. It'll be two and a half years since the last time. I mean, I, you know, I'm nervous about it too. It's always like that facing a new group of students and not having <laughs> taught for a while in that in that medium it's like yeah and I've got all sorts of changes that I've been making to how I've been teaching so I'm excited to share those changes with people awesome well that's part of well that is uh, part of the main focus of what I wanted to talk to you about here and I'm not 100% sure that everyone listening is familiar that uh, two of the books that you've written that I have, uh, one, Ashtanga Yoga As It Is, which does a very good job of detail, detail mapping out all of the vinyasas of the first, second, third, and fourth series of Ashtanga Yoga. And then your book, uh, Vinyasa Krama, which has multiple alternative sequences that you've created in the tradition of vinyasa flow that also includes a very extensive visual asana library, which uh, is a great tool as a yoga teacher to have personally, in my opinion. Um, And so you have the Ashtanga method, which has a very structured and detailed sequence of postures and practice and you've obviously explored in detail and in depth uh, altering those routines and creating different routines and what I'd like to ask you about is how you go about instructing students in the variation off of those two main approaches and if you could explain some of the nuances involved in the way that you're approaching teaching yoga currently? Uh, Okay, so I'll give a very short synopsis of my history, I guess, with Ashtanga Yoga. So, you know, being introduced to vinyasa through Ashtanga Yoga, because in in the days when I started, there there wasn't such a thing really as vinyasa flow. It was mostly things like Shivananda Yoga, uh, Iyengar Yoga, and uh, Ashtanga Yoga. And so Ashtanga Yoga was, in a way, quite formalized in terms of the structure of the sequence. And so if you were learning vinyasa, you know, primary series was what you were learning for the most part. It, it was not till years later that people started, even in Iyengar Yoga, doing different sequencing and some rebel Iyengar teachers doing a bit of vinyasa flow. But that happened, you know, that's very, a fairly recent history thing, vinyasa flow. Um, well, anyway, so... Um, through teaching Ashtanga, I'd always been interested in the, the purported individual approach of self-practice that Ashtanga claims to teach. But by and large, it's a tr- I don't want to offend anyone, but by and large, the Ashtanga system, you, 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 it's the overall intention is it's better if you stick with standard primary, like your 
a, a better practitioner or a more focused practitioner mm. or it's more devoted or and th- th- and there's reasons for that and I think there's a there's a place for that kind of thing because it, it does help you with focus and being able to work through the quite difficult and vigorous and uh, somewhat more rajasic sequencing that, that that exists within the Ashtanga method um, and so in order to get better at that you kind of have to focus on that exclusively which means for the most part sticking with the sequence it's only in recent years that you know there's a kind of, I would say, maybe about a 50-50 divide in the Ashtanga community between the more traditional approach and those perhaps more long-term teachers like me who are, oh, well, I'm no longer teaching Ashtanga, but let's say teach people teaching Ashtanga yoga, but saying to students, you know what, maybe this version of Mrityasana D isn't appropriate for you, 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 you do this instead. Mm, or, yep. or maybe, you know, these kinds of backbends aren't appropriate for you, Kapotasana, you shouldn't do that, you should do this instead. So there's a number of, I think, decent Ashtanga teachers doing that. And that's kind of how I started with this idea that, well, if I think that someone shouldn't be doing half lotus because they've got a busted meniscus, which I think is a general truth, then you have to decide whether teaching that part of the sequence or the sequence itself is appropriate for some people. Mm. Asking that question is important, but I, I, I suspect a lot of, the more traditional Ashtanga teachers don't want to ask that question because the idea is, no, the sequence is perfect. It's coming from God. You, you must stick with it and, and and it'll get better, which is not really true. It's just that's what you hope for. And we all hope for things getting better, but it doesn't always work that way, right? <laughs> Correct. So, so that whole – once I started down that rabbit hole, and it is admittedly a rabbit hole, um, um, I was like, well – I kept making these choices, having these choices presented to me of, okay, am I teaching the, the, at that time, the Ashtanga sequence because it's what I think is good for the student or what, or what I think is good for the system. Mm. And, and asking that question was interesting. And as I said, I don't think many people really know enough to be able to frame that question, certainly not in that way. And as I, the further I got into it, the more I realized my only response is, I have to do what I really think is good for the student, despite what the rules of the system might be. Mm. And so that, for me, that ended up being breaking a whole lot of rules that if you're following any traditional Ashtanga teacher, you're not allowed to break. And then you you know, then you have to decide on what measure of ethics or congruency you're going to have with what you're teaching versus what you think better. And so I, I just started that process. And I know a lot of teachers have started it, but I... I followed it through to a conclusion that I think most teachers, you know, it's a lot of work to figure out sequencing and what's good for. And, and I'm not to say that I know what's best for people either. That's part of it. Like, you know, I, I don't personally believe any teacher really knows what's better for their students. You don't. You just guess. You know, you just guess. Roll the dice. Make educated guesses, but it's a bit <laughs> of dice rolling. <laughs> shit, I hope this works. You know, shit, I hope this works out, and I hope I don't. I don't make whatever their condition is any worse. At the minimum, at the minimum, I'm going to try and at least not make it worse. And then as, as things go, I'm trying to make it better. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that, I think that's a good rule of thumb, a good standard. But if you're sticking with anything exclusively with this idea that it's, the system is better or not changing it is better, then you're going to be hurting people whether you realize or not. Mm. And that can be psychological as well as physical. And most people admit to this or can admit to this, but then in practice don't necessarily, like I said, I don't think a lot of people necessarily follow through. So a few years ago, not that long ago in, 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 red, in, in the overall scheme of things, but I, I reached a sort of turning point where I was teaching moon sequence, other sequencing that was, say, more gentle than Ashtanga, but also geared towards variation where – a student, not just me, but a student can say, you know what, I don't want to do those backbends today. I want to do the sequence like this. So it's what I call scaling down, mm-hmm. where you go, I don't want to do the whole thing. I want to, I want to modify, and, and, and then you have a discussion with the student, and then fine, it's, it's, it's totally acceptable. So, and, and then scaling sideways when a student has certain restrictions or just not sleeping well or whatever the, the, the state is, and so I think it's fair to change these things versus going, no, no, you must always do the same thing and you'll get better if you do. And there's some truth to that, but there's also high risk for trouble, injury, or just, just a lot of difficulties. 
so there's you know there has to be a like a what I call a co-created relationship in that between the teacher and the student, and the student gets to make plenty of decisions in terms of you know maybe they only want to do a half hour practice. Well, great. Maybe mm. they only want to do more pranayama versus asana. Also good. And so that needs to be understood, supported, and and people need to be helped with that. So a few years ago, I reached this sort of sort of tipping point, I guess, where I was teaching Ashtanga Yoga and these alternative sequencing. So you've mentioned the two books. So I was in my head, I was like, well, I need to combine these two. But then I decided, I, I just realized I wasn't an Ashtanga teacher anymore because I didn't believe in following the sequences as making anyone that much better off. I mean, maybe you get a bit more physically strong in certain things, maybe a bit more physically flexible. But in terms of overall yoga practice, it didn't it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And and so then I, I had a, for example, I had a version of primary series that I was teaching people and I realized, at least for me and my community, it was better because it didn't require people to have an advanced practice. Like primary for most human beings is way too difficult. <laughs> and, yeah. and I don't want to teach, I don't want to teach to the top 2% of the human population. That's a, like in terms of teaching yoga, that's a, yeah. I'm, I'm okay yeah. to teach I'm quite okay to teach to the top 50% because yeah. the bottom 50%, honestly, you know, not really interested. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, which we could come into later. But the top 50%, I'm really interested in teaching because they're people who are motivated. They want to do yoga. They don't necessarily want to be too strict about it. Um, some of them, well, some of them are fully focused practicing five, six days a week, many of my students. But, but I'm not limited by that. It's not a necessity. And so... I ended up dropping primary and things like that because the, at least the way I was taught it and the way I understood it, it was setting people up for, for being more restrictive, not, not more free. Mm. Because if you're going to focus on that method, the general gist and the general rule is you're, you're not supposed to do anything else, yeah. including other forms of meditation, pranayama and exercise. Mm. You know, it's frowned upon. You know, generally, I mean, some teachers allow for that stuff, but most most Ashtanga teachers aren't really teaching it. They're not really teaching comprehensive pranayama. They're not really teaching comprehensive meditation, let alone supportive referrals for psychotherapy and those kinds of things. I mean, I think any, I mean, that's hard for any teacher, mind you, to be good at all those things, but at least to have the option for referrals. So maybe you're not that good at teaching alignment. Well, maybe you know an, a, an Iyengar teacher and you tell some of your students, you know what, I think you need to work on your alignment, go to this teacher. Mm -hmm. Either that or you have to learn how to teach better alignment so that you know some anatomy and, anatomy and physiology versus just going, that's, that's trick on us and that's it. Yeah. It's like, well, that's, that's a pretty sloppy way to teach. <laughs> I, I think any good teacher learns some of these things, but, my concern is it's often not in, well, it depends. If you've only been teaching for a year or two, it's fair enough that you don't know too much stuff. Okay, you know, but if you've been teaching for five or ten years or so, you, you, there's a lot of stuff you really should know. So that's my hope with this kind of thing, that, that more students, more teachers embrace more of the holistic elements versus only one part of it. Mm, yes. It takes time. I mean, you got to, you know, you've got to give time for students and even give time to teachers to learn because you can't. You're a first year teacher. You're not. You should. You know. You should know five or six postures and teach them, and that's it. <laughs> and then, well, that's fine. You know, that's really okay. And then over over the course of the next year and the year after that, you keep picking up not just the asana stuff, the physical stuff, but also the you know the philosophical, the meditative stuff. And just bit by bit, you know, expand your repertoire and teach all of that. So that's really all I've been doing. And so I, I ended up more or less discarding Ashtanga, not because I don't think it's worthy for people to practice and teach that method. It's just partly because I don't have enough time. But I teach a lot of different sequences that do enough of the same things with a much greater therapy in mind. Mm. Because the, the, you know, one of the first of all, people can learn up to well four or five different sequences over the course of a few years. You don't learn them all off in the first week, but you you get to choose some of these different sequences from the beginning to suit your constitution. Yeah. Versus you know anyone doing Ashtanga, you learn primary. That's it. There's no yeah. and yeah. people people who would make the claim that that's good for everybody is 
you know, that's, that's a foolish statement. It's completely untrue. And so it, it doesn't work for probably 90% of the population. And so, and, and, and for the 10% or 5% that it does work for, it's fantastic. Primary is great. But for, for the rest of humanity, it's like, well, there needs to be some other possibilities, other variations. So this is, this is essentially what I do. How are you in the online world or within the past year and a half? <clears throat> so I, I get the feeling from listening to you speak that because you're really engaged in the process of teaching that you're allowing for your teaching to evolve and grow and shift, how what would a class session look like currently if someone signs up to practice with you? Are you able to instruct within a group setting or are you primarily or mostly working on a one-on-one -on -one individual level? Well, I, I just have transferred how I taught online uh, live courses into an online structure. So I don't do, I do do individual emails and stuff and occasionally individual chats for people who've got specific questions or difficulties. So we just, I set up a Zoom chat like this and usually with the video on. And I, so I do that. But the, the main way I teach at, at the moment are through, I, I've got it set up in a particular way, but these six-week courses. And a six-week course involves a combination of lead classes where I'm instructing like a lead class. I'm, I'm talking people through the postures and the breaths and all the basic instructions for a, for a sequence. Um, so that's one aspect of it, and I record those classes so people can also watch them afterwards to to learn the sequences and memorize the pattern, but also learn the variations. So every time I teach a sequence, I'm often put doing a a different set of variations within mm. a within the framework of a sequence. Nice. So you know, if it's a level one sequence, I don't add a whole lot lot of level two and level three stuff just to entertain people. I keep yeah. everything within level one. And there, but there's a significant amount of variations there each time I might do a lead class. So people can see, oh, I can change it like this and this. It's not, it has a theme or a structure and, and we stick within a certain style, but there's a number of vari variables there. And I think this is, I really enjoy that part of it. So I don't get bored teaching the same thing every day, right. but also so students learn, oh, if I want to do this extra part for the shoulders, I can, or if I want to do less of these back backbends I can, or if I want to add these inversions I can, and that's within each sequence. There's a possibility for a few different nice. number of different changes. Nice. So that's one. Number two would be I teach self practice. So so in a group format. So part of the course is then students do the sequence with cheat sheets or not at their own pace, and so they're going with their own breath, their own flow, and I just give corrections and give alignment advice. I you know just help people to learn the sequence, but also adapt the sequence this is where it'll be individual so someone has trouble with back bends okay let's change these and these and we'll do these instead let's focus on opening up the shoulders and upper back first and then so we change little parts of the sequence to suit them but that's done as a group so there's between most groups i have are between 10 and 15 and so it's enough to me to give individual but there's a group setting so it's financially uh, works out for me <laughs> so you don't have to charge people a lot of money for yeah. a private class and that sounds look similar to a my store style practice, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just and I just call it I just call it self practice, um, and so yes, it's it's going at your own pace. Um, but yeah, and it's the same basic style as as you would have in my store style. Yeah. Oh, and uh, just to finish, the third and probably just as important as the other two, the third main aspect of every course is people start learning the level one series of pranayama which includes some meditation uh, from me and I include and incorporate that with their asana practice from the beginning. Nice. So they're learning a, a series of four different pranayama techniques, all very easy to learn, but involve quite a lot of detail. Um, and so that's in, as a part of, you know, it's, a, it's an inclusive system. So it's it, right from the beginning, you learn these essential tools, which help you with, you know, sitting postures, just being able to sit, comfortably for half an hour, being able to breathe more efficiently when you're doing vinyasa or all this kind of stuff. So those are the three main elements, lead class, self-practice class, pranayama class. Nice. How do you feel now, Matthew, with not doing hands-on assisting has your appreciation and or uh, 
feeling that maybe you don't need it moving forward in a live group setting, <clears throat> how has your thoughts and feelings shifted with that, with this sort of, uh, you know, being with people all the time and in a room where you could actually go up and interact and move their foot and literally help them to, to learn some of what you're trying to convey verbally through a hands-on assist? Are you finding that maybe you don't want to incorporate that anymore, that it's not necessary? Or is it something that you find that because you haven't been able to incorporate it, that you can't wait to involve it again? What are your feelings with that nowadays? I Well, I miss it, first of all. And so I like that, that the physical touch part of it. But I also like the personal contact part of it, where people feel a lot more real when they're in front of you. And in some ways, people are more accountable. You just look at things like how people respond on YouTube or, or yeah. you know, Facebook posts. And, you know, there's a lot of terrible behavior out there because people aren't <laughs> accountable. Um, now, I don't find that in the way I run groups online because it's very, it's very private. Like, I keep my groups very small. Like, I have an online, an online Facebook page, but I, I limit the numbers there so that people can't, stay on that page unless they're ready to commit to actually practice with me, you know, on some level. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't need thousands of students. I'm happy with, you know, 100, 200 students a year, plenty. Yeah. And, and if those students are committed, it's, that's brilliant. It's fantastic. I've, I have no interest in teaching 5,000 people. I, I think it's a, you know, my business model is great because it's, it's, I manage off 30 or 40 people a week. That's it. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not trying. You know, you, you have 200 people. All of a sudden, it's not individual. It's not personal, and it's stressful. Yeah. Now, some people, some great teachers out there, manage that particular met style, but it's not. It's not for me. Yeah. I, you know, I, as I say, I manage maybe 30, 40 people a week. That's it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm totally happy, and I, those 40 people, I'm really like involved. You know, I want to connect. So, I, I would say. I could potentially only just teach online and I would be satisfied enough with that. <laughs> and yeah. from a financial point of view, I can make that work. But uh, that's not all I want to do. I definitely want to also do live courses. And there's a different extra bit of learning that happens in person, I think, that's yeah. very important. Um but on the other hand, I would not now get rid of online courses. Like if all of this just went away in a flash and I could have loads of courses here in Bali, I, I wouldn't. I would keep at least half my online courses going because firstly, it does get me a wider audience, but also, then this is just for me. This wouldn't be for every teacher. In, in past, when I used to teach courses, I would see a student absolute maximum once a year normally. Well, some crazy people would do two, three courses a year, but that's pretty rare. So a lot of <laughs> students, they'd come once every two years to do a course. And so the level of continuity with learning from me was very much stop-start. So people would have a break, they'd come back, you know, they first week or two of the course, they'd be sore, they'd be trying to, you know, maybe they maintain practice at home, but it's not the same, you know. Yeah. And so for them, the learning continuity is, in that style was lacking because I just don't teach in that sense I wasn't teaching casual classes but now with the online even though it is done through a course for the most part it, it allows people to practice with me and learn from me quite consistently so that's fantastic it just means I think the learning process is better um, and so yeah my long term goal now I guess is is to combine the two the combination of both live courses which are going to be much more intense focus on, you know, developing certain parts of practice, you know, meditation, pranayama, asana, um, with the online courses, which, which provide the continuity, you know, consistency. Nice. I agree with you. I'm, I'm curious with, <clears throat> I remember when I first started practicing, it was in a very sequentially orientated environment, a very strict uh, sequence orientated focus. And <clears throat> earlier you had made mention that there might be physical, but also psychological repercussions to that. And that piques my attention. I, I understand the physical side pretty clearly that if we just 
do the same thing over and over every single day, while that could be very beneficial if it was establishing new patterns, it could help to, you know, rewire and reestablish. But then if it just stays on that one pattern forever and ever that there's so much potential for outside of that. And that maybe you said the harm could be physical in terms of if I overuse a forward bend and I don't develop back bending, that there might be an imbalance there in the psychological side though. What do you see in regards to that? What's something that you've observed that is like almost like a psychological side effect of being stuck in a, um, very strict sequential patterning. You've you've just answered the question more or less. (laughs) I think it's good to go into detail. You you use the word stuck and that's really it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a truth of any system. If you, and you know whether it's sociological system, a, a, a physical health system like yoga or like asana, um, even a, 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 a so-called mental health system like like psychotherapy or even meditation. If you get caught too much in the right or wrong or the dogma or the the rules of the system, you become a slave to it. Whether you admit it or not, you become you become subservient to the rules of the system. It's like anyone who's extremely left or right politics. This is prevalent with particularly countries like America, where the more involved you are in one of those stances, the the more you're beholden to the rules of that stance. Mm. That doesn't that those rules don't belong to us. They're just a part of what makes us easier to understand what that system is yeah. or what the boundaries of that system is. I think that's fair enough to have some of those rules because it's uh, boundaries are, are healthy for certain things. Like you know, when we drive in traffic, don't drive on the wrong side of the road because you you'll probably die and probably hurt someone else. So that's not that's not a good idea. So certain rules we all we all sort of tend to agree on, but too far down that rabbit hole, and it's like, well, there there may be a freak time when you do need to drive on the wrong side of the road to avoid a semi trailer coming at you or whatever because he's on the yeah. wrong side of the road too. I mean, you know, there's exceptions, but the the point is. The more we get involved with any system, any any process of learning, there can be, temporary or not, there can be a tendency to invest. The more we invest in something that, that we find useful or beneficial or that we just agree with philosophically, the more beholden we tend to get to the rules. And so we go from a learning phase which tends to be expansive and open and, and freedom-making so something that's what's what's in, in sociological terms, it's what's on the expanding edge. So when you first learn anything new, you're at the edge. You're on the expanding edge of learning, of, mm. of your own stylistic process. Once you've spent 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years learning something and investing in it, once you've become invested, you've also become attached. Yeah. We understand attachment in yoga as well, not that we know what to do with it, but we understand that that can be a problem or, or basically is a problem. Because the more attached you are to something, the more rigid you're going to be, the more opinionated and locked in and, you know, and so it stops being about freedom. And so we've moved from the expanding edge to what's called the hard center. And the hard center is full of law, it's full of rules, it's full of black and white, it's full of right and wrong. That's, it would be the same as terms of left and right politics. You can get the same issues with people on the expanding edge and staying there and saying, all you people in the middle are bankers and assholes and rigid and you, you all should be you all should be killed you know we should get rid of you because you're preventing my freedom yeah now and that's there's the sort of one of the arguments for you know, why people make these stances in left and right and both are equally appalling because it's not inclusive yeah we, we need the rules of the hard center otherwise a society can't function you've just got chaos you've got you know terrible things happening if, if you only go to the expanding edge and out into chaos, you've got terrible things happening. You know, so too many rules are bad. Too many people breaking rules is bad. <laughs> but we need, but we need both. Yeah. And that, and that's as a human, that's it's like the ultimate one and the ultimate zero in, in to use that idea. It's the ultimate annihilation or the ultimate individual importance. And as a human, we've got to be able to somehow move between those two, and that's uncomfortable. 
Mm. If you've spent time learning a system, you say, Ashtanga yoga is great. It's the golden recipe, you know, the golden pill that's going to bring me to enlightenment. Well, it's not. And the more you think that, if you're a teacher, you're going to be punishing your students, whether you realize it or not, you know, making their lives absolute misery for the most part, whether they realize it or not. I mean, but on the other hand, if you've just got, I don't know, what would be a, an alternative example? A vinyasa flow teacher who says, oh, I just wake up and I, I just do what feels good to me in the moment. That's all I do. And then that kind of person is mostly just self-indulgent. They're, they're not really focusing on what they need to do. They're focusing on what their ego wants. Yeah. And that's yeah. another, I'm not, I don't want to, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to criti- I mean, they're both great. Like Ashtanga is fantastic. Vinyasa flow is fantastic. I understand. It's just that if you take either of those things to an extreme, you end up with, you know, you, you end up in a limitation. You end up being just more stuck than you were in the first place. Yeah. So to come back to your, your question, it comes down to what your intention or basic, yeah, what, what your basic intention is or overall intention is with anything you do or with the system that you're practicing. Mm. If your intention is just to get more flexible and more strong, then if, if that's what's occurring, then keep going. If your intention is to be having that and maybe some deeper personal understanding of self or, or how you are functioning, whether physically or psychologically, that, you know, also good. So, I mean, it, it, intention is a, is a, a big thing, a big thing for, for, for any, any endeavor. Mm. Agreed. So where Agreed. we run into trouble yeah. with this is, is when we get stuck, and one of the main ones, in, in, and it's in yoga as well as anywhere, even though yoga says it claims all these spiritual this and spiritual that, most of which is, you know, it's easy to say, hard to do, um, is does the system fundamentally embrace change? And mm. if you look at most systems, they do not. Mm. Right, not not and when I when I say fundamental, I mean on every level. For example, is the student allowed to say, "I'm not practicing that today. I want to practice this," and then you get a discussion. Doesn't mean the student's always right, but it doesn't mean the teacher's always right. They know you're not allowed to change the system. You must practice how I'm saying. Right. Right. And so yeah. most systems, that's the problem you run into, is because. I mean, it's, it's tough on the teacher, don't get me wrong. Like, if you have students whinging and whining and complaining, and I don't want to do that, I don't want to, I just want to, you know, it's like, oh, God. You know, and so you, you know, shut up and just do your practice, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Now, there may be time for that, but honestly, it's quite rare. It's not, it's not that often that a student annoys me so far that I feel I need to say something like that. But the, the problem then isn't really the teacher or the student, it's that the system the way the system is set up is, is the system is saying it's more important than the student. Good point. I mean, just, I mean, yeah. you think about that. I mean, I, yeah. I asked this question to people. I don't know if I said this in the last talk. I hope I didn't. So it, it's a simple question. And I, I, I'll, I'll say this to you, pretending that I'm saying this to a, a live audience, right? Um, when you're practicing yoga, right, which, which, Fundamentally, when you really look at practicing yoga, what part of it is fundamentally what we would call spiritual? It's a sort of a trick question. <laughs> it's an obvious yeah. one when you know the answer. Because when you're practicing yoga, well, well, is the thing you're practicing spiritual in and of itself? Now, okay, you could expand that out and say, yes, everything's spiritual, therefore what you're practicing is spiritual. But then by the same token, Cleaning the toilet is spiritual because, Correct. you know, you, you should have, your, you know, your toilet should be clean. A clean toilet is a very good idea. Cleaning your teeth is spiritual, right? So anything spiritual. But in terms of just limit, limit this to practicing yoga, when you are practicing yoga, what part of that is fundamentally spiritual? Mm-hmm. And there's only one answer. I'll put you out of your misery because I, I sometimes <laughs> I, make, I make a whole class go for an hour while people discuss this because it, it goes round and round in circles. And, and, and it's interesting, and an average group won't come up with the answer because they're, they're thinking in terms of what they're practicing. Right. So when we're practicing something, the only thing that's spiritual is you, the you that's practicing. The practice is not spiritual. 
you are. And when you make that clear distinction, it's like, oh, shit. So that means <laughs> any system that's claiming to be spiritual is basically wrong. Mm. Because it's not spiritual in and of itself. It's just a thing. It's an object. It's a technique. It's a method. Yeah. And if it's saying it's spiritual, the reason for that is to keep you within the club, is to keep you there for a combination of reasons. One, because maybe it's good for you. We can hope for that. But two is because of power and money. And all systems, whether it's political, sociological, or yoga, they tend to lean that way because it keeps you in the system. That's a good point. That so doesn't mean it's good for you. It doesn't. So the only thing that's spiritual is fundamentally you. The, the, and I don't mean you, the mind, or the body. I mean you, the, the self. All right, the, the broader self. And it's, it's always there. It's always spiritual. It doesn't matter whether you practice or not. You're still spiritual. Just because you practice something doesn't make you more spiritual. That's ridiculous. How can something make you more of what you already are? I mean, this is crazy, crazy thinking, but yet <laughs> it's embedded in most systems. You practice this, oh, six days a week, I'm more spiritual. Therefore, I'm better than you scumbags because you're not. Mm. I mean, ridiculous. What a horrible thing to start believing in. And yet, and yet we all kind of want to because it's like, oh, I feel good about myself if I do these practices. Now, a lot of these practices do help us to look back at ourselves and explore, oh, who am I in this? But the looking back is essentially you looking at you. And so that's what's spiritual. It's just you. This, this eye of consciousness that is expansive and open pretty much automatically just by the act of looking. And so the idea that you have to do some system or sequence in order to get better at spirituality is a bit of a mistake. Now, you do the sequence and system because it may help you physically, great, and also because it may help you psychological, psychologically, which is a, a, the bigger part of your question. But I, I wanted to come to that because yes. the, the damage happens when we, when we, the system itself starts saying, if you do this in this in such and such a way, then you will be better as a person or a being or a, you know, towards enlightenment or spirituality. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, those conscious or unconscious, you know, statements within a system are, are misleading, misleading or mis misguided, I guess I could say. Um, I'm not saying they're entirely wrong because at the beginning it's useful to have those boundaries so that people go, well, look, here's this system. This is how we start. And so you've got to start somewhere. So that's good to have those boundaries. Yeah. But in a, in a bigger perspective, it becomes damaging psychologically because you're not practicing freedom doing that. It's, it's actually the opposite. Great answer. Great answer, Matthew. That was excellent. <laughs> When, anyway, I, I hope it. I hope it makes sense. And it I'm, does I'm, make sense. I'm not. It does right, make I'm sense. not trying to say this to say people shouldn't then practice ashanga. You should, but then you, you must look outside of that box sooner rather than later. I'm with if you. If you don't, if you don't, it's a severe limitation. And that's true of any system. It's a yeah, severe limitation. Yeah, if you're yeah. way into less social politics, there's a whole lot of stuff on the right that's damned important. And if you don't understand that, you've you've you're shooting yourself in the foot. Just as anyone on the far right of politics is going, no, these left socialist hippies, you know, we should shoot them all. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, it's moronic. <laughs> it's just because people <laughs> want to, a position, you know, it's, it's, it's more com sort of more temporarily more comfortable to be in black or to be in white. And I'm yeah. like, no, oh, you know, no, yeah. it's, it's, there's a whole lot of gray area out there and I'm, I'm fine with that. That's a good point. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk about politics. No, I, I – <laughs> well, I, I think the way that you're explaining it is spot on, and I don't feel like you're necessarily saying this side or that side. You're just kind of looking at it from a bird's eye perspective and analyzing it and looking at the way these systems can either control or, like you said, bring about freedom. I'm curious that, you know, obviously because you – know the Ashtanga method, have practiced the Ashtanga method intensely or intensively and put your due diligence forth in the practice. And then at some point, 
I guess if I were to backtrack when I was mentioning that I started off in very sequential practice, I remember someone telling me a story about a yogi. Uh, I don't know if whether people think he's popular or not or like him or not, but a man named Amrit Desai, I guess he was practicing and there was a group of people yeah. in a circle watching him practice. And he, yeah. he would just, his, and that this, this came to me through story. So I didn't see this myself, but he, I guess, made claim, okay, I'm going to practice completely in the moment. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And I'm going to wait for some intuition to guide me to what I'm going to practice next. And when I heard this, I thought, wow, well, what would that be like? And where does that come from? And how does, what does that look like? Or what does that feel like? And could I do that? And I guess that's what I'm curious for you and in, in your journey are what is it, was it hard to get off of the rails, the, the systematic rails and go, I'm just going to try this, even though it's not in this specific order. And does that start to get, did that start to get easier for you? And, and then even currently, do you explore that space of trying to figure out in the moment, like, <laughs> what should I do right now? Or, you know, or, 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 or do you consciously sometimes go into like a couple of patterns to like get some like mojo going, some energy going and then say, okay, cut loose, go free and see what happens. Where, what, what is it like for you when you're practicing these, these concepts? Um, I only occasionally do the full free flow thing. I do like it. Um, I just how I've been generally. I like a little bit of structure, just because. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hear you. I think. I think. I mean, look. Th there's advantages and disadvantages. Like, like. Okay, if we if we use if I use those two polarities. So if I would say the more traditional Ashtanga approach is okay. There's the primary theory. And you're you're just it's preferable that you learn the sequence without changing anything. Yeah. At least how it's currently taught, which you know how it's currently taught has been has changed since 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, etc. It keeps changing. This is uh, to go back to my earlier point. This is one of the funniest <laughs> things. The system does change, even though everyone says, "Well, no, this is how you should practice it." But it's like, well, yeah. that's completely contradictory because it has changed. But you're saying the student's not allowed to change it. Only yeah. the head teacher is allowed to do that because the head teacher is godlike, which is foolish because clearly they're not. Um, so, you know, that, that's a problem because it means you're basically saying to students, you're not smart enough to know what to do yeah. with your own body. Yeah. Only, only the system is right. But so at that extreme, it's like, here's the sequence, here's the system, follow it. This is better because. You know, for the first maybe year or two for a lot of students, that's fair enough because students don't know better. Yeah. But given a little bit of experience, the student knows damn well if something hurts or not. Yeah. They go, look, that's hurting. I don't want to do that. And then the teacher says, no, keep practicing. It'll get better. Well, that's a friggin' gamble. I mean, gee whiz. That's a, <laughs> and that's a, a fairly common one in Ashtanga. And I think that's a terrible gamble to be making with someone who's in genuine pain. Yeah. Like, no, I don't want to add insult to injury there. That's psychological damage right there. But... Then at the other extreme, you can have someone who maybe never had any discipline in their life but loves doing yoga and how it feels and probably has some natural aptitude for it as well because if they're super restricted in the body, it's going to be unpleasant just to do whatever you want because you know, there's too many things you can't do. So, But let's say someone has a fair amount of natural ability and they just go into free flow. Despite the natural ability, 99% of the time you're going to be false into the things you like. Mm. Whether you say, I'm yeah. trusting my intuition, it's a it's a spiritual flow. And I'm like, I've heard that word, and I'm like, no, it's not. That's <laughs> just, it's just a more subtle form of your ego, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with the ego, but but it's still ego. It's not, there's nothing innately spiritual about that just because you think you're in the flow. What usually happens then is you focus on stuff you're already good at. So if you're a natural backbender, I guarantee Anyone doing free flow vinyasa is doing a whole bunch of backbends. Yeah. Not not only, yeah. but that's probably going to be the main part of their practice. And if they really suck at arm balancing, they're not going to be doing any arm balancing. Or if they really suck at sit-ups and core strength, they're not going to do any of that. And so 
this is the main problem with vinyasa flows. You will naturally avoid all of your trouble spots. Yeah. And the old, old get the worse that gets is because the body, you know, <laughs> the body gets older. So <laughs> it does. now I, I agree with that. I would agree with free flow philosophically because psychologically you are better off with it. Mm. Right. I just yeah. think that 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 how oh, well, better off that. I, yeah, I just tend to think it's a, it's a, it's an improvement on the restrictive side, but without the restrictive side, the the good thing about Ashtanga is you don't get to miss things that you're not good at. You have to work on it. Yeah, and that's I like that. I think that's brilliant. I think it's excellent that you, are, you know, ideally helping a student to do core strength, to do things they don't want to do, like alignment in standing postures. Yeah. A lot of people just avoid alignment. I'm like, hang on, no, 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 trikonasana. Uh, you know, flexible advanced student. Trikonasana, you're kidding me. All right, no more advanced pulses for you. Let's focus on trikonasana. Mm. Get your alignment sorted out. Again and again and again. And once I see that, then we can start doing the things you like. Uh, and then, I mean, people are like, oh, okay, okay. He, he's on, on, he's on at me with my alignment. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing it to help. You know, um, so I, I'm. I'm probably slightly more on the Ashtanga side of the fence. I don't want to be, but just because I want people to focus on the things, also to focus on the things that they're not good at. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a little bit on that side of the fence in terms of structure, but but I encourage students every day you wake up and you go, you start doing a sequence and you go, oh, this is not right. Don't change it. You know, you, you need to have some in the moment, start doing something. It's either too slow, too fast, too intense, whatever it is, it's too much, you know, and then you just change it. You you can still practice. Maybe you could decide you do meditation instead. Maybe you decide you're going to, actually you're doing too, something too soft. You need to be more dynamic just because whatever. So um, I just do that via a set sequence that within the sequence, we allow for all sorts of modifications. Mm. So that's, that's just how I've done this. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the only way or even the best way. I'm sure, or, you know, because some of the vinyasa flow teachers I've talked to, I think, oh, that sounds really good that you can just help develop people to be more in the moment. And just from a purely a meditation point of view, I think that's really fantastic to be sort of spontaneous. Um, I'm a little more strict. <laughs> <laughs> yes just, I think that's maybe a personality thing I'm not saying it's a better way at all but I think yeah but I, I, I find it, it works for, for me practice and teaching wise you know I, I follow a theme of a sequence and then mostly I stick with it and I can change that each day it seems to work that's cool Matthew I, I might have lost your microphone close to your mouth a little there, right toward the end. It started kind of fading fading a little farther back there. Um, was it too close or too far? Oh, think? that's that's good. I can hear you again. <laughs> I think it started to get too far away. So I, I'm, I'm curious, when I look at your visual asana library, and I'll, I'll use that sometimes before I go into teach because I'll get into this rut of – you you know, in my favorite poses, my favorite poses to teach, kind of like what you said in the vinyasa flow uh, syndrome, so to speak, of what am I good at? That's what I can demonstrate. This is what I'll try to encourage everyone to do today. And I'll look at your, your visual asana library and go, oh my gosh, I haven't seen that one. Or that looks really interesting. And, and try to practice it, obviously, myself to try to, you know, learn the pose but I find it's really helpful to have that as like a tool to get inspired to mix it up and keep it dynamic. Um, with that being said, what you're able to do physically in terms of that asana library is pretty outstanding. And I'm curious, you did make a little mention just a while ago, like in terms of as we're aging, things do change. And then we, we both laughed because <laughs> it seems to and um i'm do you have a protocol and or approach for teaching how to manage injury and or 
avoid injury or be present to um, listening and and coaching injury and and healing. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. There's a few good points in that. Um, I guess the one I'll start with is it's a it's a funny little thing that I I I got taught this early on when I, I guess my first couple of teacher trainings, but also with with you know, various forms of psychotherapy that I've done. So this is more from a teaching point of view than from a practice. So as a teacher, the first thing I do is really simple, and it's ask questions. I don't, I don't trust exactly purely the visual because that's not enough trust. You have to unpack it with the student saying, all right, how does that feel? Does it feel better or worse? Is mm. When you do this each time, is it the, more or less the same difficulty each and every time? And based on their response, I, I, it's very quick then to, to narrow down what's going on. If, if I don't have that kind of communication, I, I'm, I'm relying on purely my, my visuals, my prior experience and my judgment. And I, I think those are unreliable. I don't, I don't like to rely on those at all. Mm. I, I use my experience after the student has told me what's going on. Um, this is something from psychotherapy and it goes like, it goes like this. And I think this is something that every yoga teacher should learn. I wish everyone would, but it's not something everyone wants to embrace. And it goes like this. The student is the expert on their body. The teacher is not. And that's ever. Every single time, the student is the expert on the experience in their body. The teacher is the expert for the technique or the method or the practice, whatever that is. But the student is the expert on their body. And you, your job as a teacher is to find out, unpack that, to, to communicate simply enough to say, hey, hey, what's going on? Is this, is this getting worse or is it getting better or is it staying the same? And those three questions, super easy to ask anybody. And you, most students are going to be quite happy to answer that question. right? And if they say, oh, it's not too bad at staying the same, you might go, okay, let's keep going like this. Let's see what happens. It's because mm. they've given you that feedback. If they say, actually, no, it's good. I mean, I know I'm not too much in alignment, but I don't feel any pain at all. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Okay, but let's try this. Does this hurt? And they go, no, no, that's fine. Okay, great. We'll keep going. But a student says, it's painful. Okay, then I might unpack that. There's three kinds of pain. Pain that more or less seems to stay the same, pain that's getting worse, and pain that's getting better. And you need to ask those questions because pain is real different. It's a sharp pain or a general pain specific location every single time, or it's moving around my back. It's on the left SI joint. It's on the right SI joint. It's a little higher up. And if it's moving around, my process of teaching is going to be different than if they're saying it's my left SI joint. It happens every time I do this. I'm like, okay, now we're going to change that. Just a simple question. Yeah. Makes it really easy. If I go off of, uh, yeah, I don't go off of, yeah, I don't go off of, just what they look like. I don't go off of, I mean, that may have helped me to ask the question in the first place. If they're pulling frowning face and clenched jaw and <laughs> rapid breathing, I'm like, okay, okay, something's going on. Or well, they're crying. You know, I'm like, okay, something's going on. All right, let's, let's see. Let's see what's going on. Talk to me. You know, and so I just think not enough teachers ask those simple questions. Like, yeah. where is the pain? Has it, has it changed? It's uh, all right, you, this is in your back. Have you had this scanned? Oh, no. How long have you had it? 15 years. Holy shit. All right, tomorrow you're going to go and get an appointment with a doctor, go and get this thing scanned. Oh, no, I'm really afraid. Well, I'm not going to help you any further if you don't get that thing scanned. I can't. That's unethical. You know, and like people are like, oh, but what if the doctor tells me I have to get an operation? You don't have to take the operation. You just need to get it scanned. Yeah. Like, yeah. people are crazy scared sometimes and it's like I understand the fear I want to be really supportive about that but it's like no 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 get your pathology get at least the scan will show you know maybe you've got a split disc maybe you've got you know whatever form of scoliosis there that you didn't notice before blah 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 so questions that's that's really one of my big just simple simple teaching tools that I do and you know if I give people teacher training it's just that our questions and then if someone has some weird condition you never heard of before, they rattle off some name and you're like, wow. And then you go look it up <laughs> and you go, yeah. okay, well, <laughs> you know, you, you can, you can, you can 
figure it out. You don't have to say to them, oh, I know what that is. It's like, no, I don't know what that is. Let me, let me ask, listen, let me go and ask Google a few questions. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that exactly, I, I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I, I hope that answers your, it does. your initial question. It does, because um, that's, I guess, basically what I was cur- I'm was. i curious is, you know, like, like you said, a, a simple teaching tool or technique for being able to help somebody move through discomfort and or pain or injury. And that's a really great answer. That's a, I like the way that you brought up with the psychotherapy as well, that the student knows their body best, the teacher knows the technique, but the 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 practitioner is the one that knows best their body asking those simple right. questions that's a great way to approach it i agree no and it supports the student it supports the student to also feel empowered to feel heard to feel a part of the process versus like a a, a victim or a captive or something you know it's like you know that they've got choice in the whole process all all along the way and then you know, then you're just trying to find a, a way to teach the method or technique efficiently for that individual student. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you mentioned aging. That would be really the same thing. I don't, I, I, I do the same with pregnancy. I don't, someone's pregnant, I don't worry too much about it. I just say, okay, how do you feel? What's your energy like? Um, you know, often, often the later that they are in pregnancy, obviously mobility is, is restricted. And so, just purely based off their natural mobility and a few, you know, simple ideas around pregnancy, like, you know, don't lie on the belly. <laughs> you know? yep, yep. I mean, old age is the same thing. I'm just asking questions. And I, you know, I get them to answer, okay, what's your general mobility like? Oh, I might get them to walk around the room if I don't know them. You know, I'll just I'll see what they, and see what their general, you know, if someone's able to walk to class to, to, to be with me, I'm like, okay, we're, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> good you know, point. If they're, if they're not able to actually walk and get to me in the first place, it's like, okay, I, I'll, I'll need to do some, it has to be in, you know, <laughs> Good Which point. Which admittedly I don't do much of these days, but, you know, as long as someone's physically and mentally mobile enough to come to me, then, you know, I've got, I've got enough to work with. And then it's just, yeah, questions, you know. And, you know, I'll see a bit like how they walk, but it's also like, you know, what, what, what do you want out of it? Like if I get an older, you know, octogenarian coming and, and I'm like, okay, what do, you, what do you want out of this? And they're not going to say, I want to learn the primary series. It's like, yeah, nope. <laughs> they're right. going to say stuff like, right. oh, I, you know, I've got this tension in my back. I just want to, it's super uncomfortable. I just want to feel more comfortable with that. It's like, okay, let's just look at that. It almost seems like some of these challenges with injury, pain, and suffering are much easier solved if we're encouraged to modify. You know what I mean? It seems well, yeah, that- I, well, yes, yes, and that starts with this idea of change. Like the, the, the fact that we, if you, it's, it's, I have some students who struggle with this, right? Is I, I, Sorry, I know I interrupted there, but it's, no, you didn't. Please go. <laughs> well, well if, if we start with the idea that the, the system is going to change, this is one of the things. If you look at even the Buddhist system, they don't they don't actually embrace this idea. It's like, no, this is how the Buddha taught it, and actually, no, he didn't. Mm. He didn't teach Buddhism as a system. He just taught some stuff. But but the system itself has to change on top of the people within the system changing. Yeah, and if the system doesn't embrace that, there's something really. When you look at that clearly, it's something very troubling about that because it means sooner or later you're going to run into these kind of roadblocks, you yeah. know, dogmatism, uh, uh, res- restrictiveness, and so that's where yes, once you've learned just some of the groundwork, some of the foundation, like if you're building a house, you want to have your foundation sorted out, you know, so you do it on solid ground. But then, you know what, you build your house and at some point, knock the house down, build another one. Foundation's still there. Or, or sell that house, go to another foundation and, and build another house. You know, it's like meta- metaphorically speaking. Yes. That works. Yes. So, but we still want to keep coming back to what various foundations. I mean, one of the foundations is um, change is a universal truth. And so we keep coming back to even a foundation is not like going to last forever. 
Yes. Even the foundation is temporary because it's just another thing. But we need to use those just to help us to, to look out beyond the foundation, to look up into the sky. So modifications are essential sooner rather than later. Yeah. Right? It's not something you should be saying, all right, after 10 years, once you've become an expert, then you can start modifying. Well, no, that's terrible. I don't think that – that basically dehumanizes people. It's basically saying you're too stupid to know better, the system knows better, or I know better. And I, I just don't like that approach. Yeah. But if we take the modify too far, then, like, for example, I, I use these three terms, scaling down, scaling sideways, and scaling up. So at any point, I allow a student to scale down however they want. That means removing a posture, making the posture easier. Right? Is, is always acceptable, and that's their choice. They can do that whenever they want, however they want, any sequence. Right. Scaling sideways requires communication because is that appropriate for the sequence or is it appropriate for what you're currently learning? And often I'll say yes to scaling sideways. So maybe uh, instead of this hip posture, I might do this hip posture. Mm. But if, if they yep. say, no, but I want to do all these handstands instead, I'll say, no, no, that's scaling up. And yeah. the answer to that is no. Real simple, <laughs> no. Because yeah. you're wanting something that I don't think you're ready for and it, I would not be doing my job properly if I said yes to that. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've got tight shoulders, you've got tight hamstring, you no. And you haven't learned the foundation of your alignment in trigonathana, so no. So scaling up is, for me, often no. Scaling sideways is usually yes, and scaling down is always yes. Nice. And so that's how, that's how I, I mean, and this may sound complicated for someone who's never heard it before, but that's how I work with modifications. Yeah. So it gives you a lot of choice, but not too much. That makes perfect sense. I like that combined with that's like a three a three step process or a triangle shape. And I like the element that you said in terms of asking about sensation. Is it a sensation that's either getting better, staying the same, right. getting worse? Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Has that And if it, it's getting worse. We're going to modify it. We're going to scale yeah. down, I guarantee. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I, don't, I really, you know, and even if it's staying the same, I'm usually like, you know what, I think we need to modify. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like the way these protocols, you have these set up as a way of, if these are the fundamentals, then when you start moving into free flow and or accepting creativity, that if these fundamentals are in place, it can be done safely. Right. And it's done mindfully where you're, okay, like you're, you're as a practitioner, you're independent enough of a teacher, but you've still got that reference when you need. So if you do get to a roadblock, you can either go back to the teacher or come back to these principles and go, okay, I probably shouldn't scale up here. Yeah. What's a suitable way to... Yeah, for me to either say, and, and most practitioners, you can learn that fairly quickly. It's like, okay, catching my big toe in trikonasana, probably not working right with my alignment, blah, 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 blah. So let's change trikonasana. So, and then the students learn that, and then they, oh, okay, that's better. So, and nice. it doesn't even matter if it's like hurting, it's knowing, knowing the modification that's more practical. Yeah. What are some of the benefits that you are finding? <clears throat> by incorporating simple pranayama right at the beginning, right at the be in the, in the early stages of the learning yoga process. What, what are some of the things that you find students that that piece being added in at an earlier stage than say, if you have to master first and second before you can begin practicing pranayama. Well, I mean, right. That old rule in Ashtanga was simply because the Ashtanga pranayama was, very simple, but incredibly vigorous. You know, you're doing like a 30 second inhale, 30 yeah. second exhale, and initially, you know, Antara Kumbhaka, and then eventually Bahia Kumbhaka. I mean, it's just a, a long ass kind of hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you didn't have a deep physical practice behind it, you, yeah. you know, you just weren't going to match. Yeah. So yeah. I start much more simply and much more gradually. I mean, it's I, look, that's my general criticism of most pranayama methods out there is they start way too complicated and way too difficult from the beginning like everybody doing full Uriyana Bandha 
kumbakas and full Nadi Shodhana right from the beginning. And I'm like, this, this is crazy ridiculous considering how most humans start. He, so yeah. I, I super simplify it. I won't go into the technique, but yeah, yeah. essentially the benefits are, well, let me give you one concept. One of the main things people do or don't do in vinyasa practice, what they do tend to do is hold the breath. Some people do it mistakenly because they think that's thunder when it's not, but they hold the breath out of tension or out of a desire to control. Mm. So one of the first things every, and I mean this, every practitioner learning vinyasa needs to learn is how to breathe in vinyasa without any holding of the breath in any vinyasa, no matter how long you practice. Mm. And so the first mm. thing you have to unlearn is, is unconscious kumbhaka. And almost everybody does it. They, you know, they exhale to a forward bend and the belly clenches and they hold the breath. Just even residual. There's this extra tension at the end of the exhale where things lock or bear down. The diaphragm gets stuck. Yeah. So the first thing to unlearn is holding of the breath. And there's all sorts of ways you can do that. So this is pranayama from the beginning, is learning how to breathe in vinyasa and do it smoothly, consistently, with control, but without the, the kind of excessive physical pressure that happens with a kumbhaka. Once yeah. that's happened, and it takes six months or a year or even two years for some people, then we, we build up on the other pranayama inside of that. So it happens within asana, but it's also something we're practicing separately, which then leads us as a wonderful stepping stone towards meditation. Yes. So these are the two things that Pranayama gives that, that you can't get by doing asana alone and you can't get by meditation alone. Is, is Pranayama helps you significantly when you do the smooth Pranayama breathing that I teach. helps you a lot with your asana practice. You're going to have a lot less pain because you're not holding your breath. You're going to have a lot more understanding, a lot more internal sense of yourself. And then in addition to that, because you're also practicing, practicing it a little bit separately to asana, is you will start developing a meditation practice. Nice. And there's yoga in a nutshell. Pranayama, asana, meditation. Yes. Awesome, Matthew. Man, I love hearing, I love having the opportunity to speak with you. I feel like my... I love teaching so much and to be able to... I know you have so many years of practice in the yoga in the actual practice and, and in teaching, I feel like it gives me a lot of motivation, inspiration to keep teaching. And I, I really appreciate oh, you taking the time to sit and talk with me. <laughs> one, one more thing I'll say on Pranayama. It's not an easy one. And this is, this goes the same for asana. And I don't expect anything to come of me saying this, but I, I, I put this message out, have done for more than 20 years is, one of the other things I've seen in Pranayama, and I see it probably 99% in Asana as well, other than the Ashtanga community, is it's all taught via lead classes. Hmm. And if you're going to teach Pranayama, it must at a certain point be self-practice. And what that means is you might guide or instruct people on this is what we're doing today, and then everyone does it at their own pace. Hmm. Because you can't learn pranayama via a lead class. You can't just go to that one, one class a week, pranayama class that your teacher's doing, and they guide you through inhar one, two, three, exhar one, two, three, four, five, six, or whatever the pranayama routine is, and that's what you do based on what the teacher's saying. Well, you, don't, you won't learn it. You cannot learn pranayama that way, not properly. The only way to practice pranayama is self-practice. Now, that should also be done with the teacher so that, you know, it's really lovely when a group of students, 5, 10, 50, doesn't matter, come together. You start guided. Maybe you do a prayer. Maybe you start a little pranayama routine all together, guided by the teacher. And then based on whatever the teacher said, you, you do a self-practice of that pranayama routine. And, and just by sitting there with other people doing this routine with you, but you're doing it at your own pace, the energy is absolutely beautiful. Nice. But... It's in my experience. I've gone to different pranayama teachers. Most of it's all like lead classes, and then maybe you're expected to practice outside of the class format on your own in the morning, which a lot of people might do. But it it, it loses something. Whereas if you come together as a group and and self practice together, uh, it's amazing. Now I will say the same thing about most asana teachers. I don't know. Do you, do you mostly teach lead classes? Is that what you do? Or I, I'm just curious. 
Yeah, I do a combination. I still teach my swear style in the morning. So, and oh, then, and then I do leg classes as, as well. And I, I also teach gentle yoga and yin yoga classes. And, um, you know, I try to change the format from which, you know, I, I teach. So I, but I, I've never though, no. I've never, no, I, 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 oh, go on, go on. No, I was just going to say, I love that you brought that up because I've only, with the Ashtanga Pranayama practice in a group setting where, you know, follow the teacher, try to hold the breath as long as the teacher does and stay with the group, so to speak. And I've never tried the way that you're speaking of, which sounds really cool. That I'm, I, Right away, my wheels were spinning thinking I want to try to get a group that's, that's Pranayama, good. my sore Pranayama right. type of thing. thing. <laughs> getting right. The hardest thing is getting enough students to be motivated to attend it regularly. Now, I don't give people a choice. So true. This is why I run courses the way I do. And so people, if they want to learn from me, they, they have to do it. They don't have it. And then everyone who does it goes, oh, I'm really glad I'm doing this now. But it, it takes that extra little, yeah. you know, putting them in pranayama jail <laughs> so that they, <laughs> they actually practice it sufficiently to go, oh, God, I don't, I couldn't. I couldn't not do that now. Yeah. Now you, you just said that you're actually teaching Mysore style. So for you, it's a little bit different, but, but the majority of teachers, and I really mean outside of the Ashanga community, the majority of teachers are teaching lead classes. And then a lot of these teachers may come to me or, or go to other teachers. Um, and they, and then what they will do at home is self practice. Yeah. Yeah. Now the way I look at that for most lead class teachers and, and it's, partly driven by finances, but it's also partly driven by what's easy, the path of least resistance. It, it's that you're practicing one method, which is self-practice, but you're teaching a whole different method because yeah. practicing self-practice and teaching lead are two very different, complementary, complementary, but two very different systems. You're right. And if you're a decent yoga teacher, I guarantee you're self-practicing but if you're not teaching self-practice, then you're not actually being entirely um, congruent. It is mm -hmm. actually a little bit hypocritical because you're you're doing you're, you're not practicing. You're not teaching what you're practicing. If you're teaching people something else, because most most lead class teachers do not go to five, six, seven, eight lead class lead, lead classes from other teachers every week. What they do is go home. Yeah. They go yeah. home and practice on their own, home. or or they practice in the studio before class. And so, you know, they're not actually learning lead classes by going to lots and lots of other teachers. They're actually, and so it's like, well, that's it's critical. It's not bad. It's not like, it's not the worst, you know, it's not an, it's not an un unethical hip hypocrisy, but it's you, a hypocrisy nonetheless. You, I see. I know. Most what you're yoga it's, I think it's funny. It's interesting. You're right. That's a really good point. It's like, if you were, let, let's say the teacher was researching, oh, I'm going to do a vinyasa flow class today on the hips. But they self practice that at home, just so they're familiar with what that, and then later on that day they teach that class. Well, if they wanted to be congruent versus hypocritical, they would get the students to self practice. Now that's, that's complicated because it means a whole lot of extra work the teacher has to do and the students have to do in order to learn that sequence. So it means the teacher has to be more consistent. The teacher has to be more knowledgeable. The teacher has to, and so do the students. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think that's a great requirement because it encourages everyone to really actually learn what the teacher's saying in third place, which, you know, it requires more work, which is probably why most people don't do it. You know, it's funny though too, Matthew, because every time that I hum and haw about the fact that I'm going to have to do more work, though, once I get involved in that process, I feel better. Do you know what I mean? Like every time I'm like, oh, but that's going to be so much more work if I have to do that. But I have no other choice. I have to do it. I'm going to just put the extra work in. And then after I start doing it, I like, I feel so great because I started, I started engaging and going a little outside my comfort zone in that, in that department too. So I told, I hear you. It's, a, it's such a paradox with that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, it's all right. Like, and and look, most teachers they're doing the best they can and doing a good job. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, it's not really a. It's just I've spent years trying to encourage teachers to teach self practice and not in the mindful style way, but in a more open vinyasa way. And it's you know, over thirty years, I've probably 
only about 10 or 15 teachers have I really gotten to the point where they're actually out of out of hundreds and hundreds of teachers. It's only 10 to 15. So it, it, it's just a, a peculiar kind of person that not only wants to teach self-practice, but, but also in the sort of more open way. Like there's a lot yeah. of Asanga teachers doing self-practice, but it's usually not so open, or at least not as open as they think it is or think it should be as they're claiming it to be. And so, yeah, it's, I, it's fine. Like I'm prepared to take time with this, but it's, yeah, it's, it's been interesting that so few teachers want to take on board the responsibility of teaching a more open self-practice style. That's interesting. It's, I, it's hear you. I hear you. So, I hear you. Because it's easier, if you're an Asanga teacher, it's just easier to sit with primary intermediate just because it's, simpler for the teacher you don't have to look outside of the box too much it's just okay there's primary there's intermediate that's it and you know it's rare that you're going to meet a student finishing intermediate let alone going further so you know 95 percent of your students are just doing half primary or full primary that's it yeah so as a teacher that's great because it means that's all you have to teach <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you, know, you, can, you, you can yeah you can you can read the newspaper while you're doing it <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't require a lot of expertise, actually. You just go, well, monkey see, monkey do. Left foot here, right foot here, off you go. Yeah. Inhale like this, inhale like this. We're, we're, we're good. It doesn't take long to learn that kind of thing, really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's just a matter of whether the student is physically capable. But, yeah, I mean, look, it's okay. I mean, pranayama is the same. If there's... On average, if I have teachers learning pranayama and teaching it, they'll have at most one class a week on pranayama, which is normal. I mean, that's, that's mostly what I do too, but I just I just pull everyone together so they all come to the... Actually, no, that's not true. I do three classes a week on pranayama, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> my basic, my level one classes are just once a week, right? Um, yeah, so... Anyway, I just say this because I have a hope that, that there's some people out there that go, you know what, even they don't have to follow me, but they go, you know, I'm going to try this teaching self practice. Like, yeah, go for it. You don't, the only thing that you need for teaching that is enthusiasm. Mm. And the only reason it will fail is if you're not enthusiastic. Mm. I mean, it's, you've got to maintain that enthusiasm through thick and thin, even if you've only got two students. If you maintain your enthusiasm, you'll get, you'll get more students coming. That's a good point. I hear you, you on know, that. I've had people say, you know, oh, my students don't want to do self-practice. It's not the students. It's you. If you, if you say it's the students, you're passing the buck. It's you. Yeah. If, if you yep. don't want to do self-practice, it's a fair choice. You don't have to. But if you really want to do it, then just do it. Yeah. And it'll work. <laughs> anyway, I... all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I hear you, Matthew, man. Well, you've been able to keep the enthusiasm up now for more than 30 years, right? Is that what you said? You've been teaching? Yeah. 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 Nice. Well, some days it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Is there coffee involved yeah. in the enthusiasm or no? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't drink coffee. Uh, you know, I, nice. I, I, try and get, I try and get all teachers and practitioners to stop having coffee in the morning. Yeah, bef- yeah, yeah. So you're not you're not teaching or practicing on fake energy. You, yeah. you you practice on your natural energy, then have coffee afterwards. But uh, nice. no, yeah, no coffee, no coffee before practice or before first, first class. I know on Bali the the one time I was there. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say that the coffee on Bali is extremely strong. Yes, I've been told. <laughs> I don't, I don't no, I, I hear you. I, I won't push you down the coffee trail. I, I just, uh, I just remember having a cup of coffee in Bali once, and and then have to run for the toilet because it was just so intense. <laughs> oh man, I hear you on that. No, I mean, I think it's the same with any stimulant like that. You know, I mean, you know, in a way, I see it the same way as you don't want to have food before you practice. Obviously, it's uncomfortable physically, but yeah, yeah, energetically. You know, so you want to be. This is why generally morning practice is better. So you want to be empty. The only thing you really should be having is either water or some kind of tea that's non-stimulating, like an alkalizing tea. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, so those, you know, those are, I think, some generic rules. Which a lot of, a lot of practitioners ignore it because they want to, they say, like, oh, either I'm too tired or they say coffee doesn't affect me. And then I say, well, go off coffee and, and prove that. And they go off coffee and coffee, I'm like, well, clearly it affects you because you're grumpy as hell. <laughs> so, you know, the claim, the claim that I'm, I'm too tired means you're working too much. Um, coffee doesn't affect me. Well, that's just a lie. So right. neither of those work. <laughs> and all the, all, the, all the coffee addicts hate me saying it. <laughs> you never know. Maybe, maybe, that. maybe they'll hear this and wake up tomorrow and say, "All right, I'm going to give it a shot. Let me see if I can do this." You know, have three cups after practice. It's fine. <laughs> Man, Matthew, well, I'm so thankful for having this opportunity again to chat with you. Do you feel like there's, do we cover our bases? Those were my two, my two main topics I wanted to talk about was asana, the finding the balance between structure and free flow. And I feel like you covered that wonderfully and answered my questions there really well. And then my second part was worrying, wondering about injury and how to manage and I love what you had to say about the scaling up, scaling down, scaling sideways, and asking the student to find out, does it feel better, worse, and or the same? I appreciate everything that, all the insight that you've lent. Do you have any other little tidbits before we close up, close here? That's pretty good. Yeah, just just the, that final one is just for teachers. Is um, you know, it's a cliche, but you know, just just open communication. I think it's good to be more transparent than a, than opaque. You know, like like I don't like to hide things behind a firewall. You know, it's like well, I mean, some things are kind of hidden just because they're advanced, not hidden, but they're you know, I'm not going to share it out of hand, but. Generally, I like things to be transparent. So, and that's just good communication, just letting people be informed about what they're practicing and why, and and that they have choice. So, you know, I mean, it's a cliche, but I think we all try and learn how to be better communicators. Yes. Nice, Matthew. Well, man, thank you so much. I know you have a. I'm coming to the close of my day here. We have a 12-hour difference between us. I know you have a whole day ahead of you. I, I wish you a really great day and trop, in tropical paradise over there. I hope everything I do, I have a great day today. You too. Thanks for that, Todd. Thank you, Matthew. I hope look forward. I'll, I'll check in here with you again in the future. Hopefully we can do this again. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Todd. All right. Have a wonderful evening. Great day. All right. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you so much for listening and for supporting Native Yoga Toddcast. I really appreciate it. I will put links in the show notes below so that you can find Matthew, connect with him, see what teaching and classes he has going on. He is available via the online medium as well as soon and or currently Bali is opening up and you can go practice with them. So check out the links below. Remember, here on our end, we have two weeks free unlimited live stream. If you want to join in, there's a link. You can check it out. And just basically, I want to say thank you. I appreciate you, the listener, for taking the time to listen to these conversations, to this conversation, and to the other ones that we have on this channel. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Matthew. I really appreciate you taking time to share your ideas, thoughts, wisdom, and insights. And I guess that is about it, my friends. So <laughs> until next week. All right. Take care. Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review and join us next time. Mm-hmm.